Good morning, everyone. I'm Carol Stern, the Executive Director of the Walton Family Foundation, and I'm really excited to serve as your guide today as we hear from some of the best thinkers, the best leaders, the best teachers, really all talking about the future of education. Like so many at the Walton Family Foundation last year, our lives were changed forever by everything that we've experienced. And the pandemic affected our grantees in very similar ways, you know, their health, their safety, their families, their work, their finances, every aspect of our lives were touched by the pandemic. Our immediate response was to try to get resources out to our grantees as quickly as possible. Let's get what they need and get it to them quick. And I was really lucky to join forces with the Bridgespan Group and some other organizations to create a kind of a disaster response playbook for philanthropy in the face of the pandemic, because there really just wasn't any kind of playbook out there. So that was our initial response, but we recognized very early on there was so much more that had to happen, so much more to do. And as the weight of the pandemic really started to come down on us, the child advocate in me really came out. You know, we became particularly concerned about young people, what they were experiencing. Millions of kids were falling behind, not just in reading and in arithmetic, but really in their aspirations for the future. Some even canceled their college plans, tried to rethink their life plans. It was just a scary time and it wasn't just about academics. Their entire lives really were interrupted. You know, they lost access to what, you know, to normalcy. That it's an age when being with peers is so critical, that psychosocial development, it means everything. And especially when it comes to learning. But for more than a year, so many of our nation's young people lost access to their peers. And that loss not only affects their academics, but it also affects their emotional learning. And now as the vaccination, excuse me, vaccination rates are, are going up, and school districts are getting ready to reopen in the fall, people are even more confident that things are returning to normal. But normal isn't good enough. This is our moment. You know, this is our moment that we can think about reinvention. This is our moment for true transformation. This is our moment that we can be the one that gives every child, really every child, regardless of where they live, regardless of their access to an education, we want to make sure they all have access to education. We wanna make sure that that education works for them, that it's an education that puts them on a path to do what they wanna do in life. The incredible leaders you're gonna hear from today are gonna to tell us how to do that. They're part of a really exciting Turn the Page project. It's a digital magazine that we launched today, launched by the Walton Family Foundation and COVID Collaborative. The Turn the Page project includes perspectives from students, from teachers, community leaders, national luminaries, it, really people who help to transform where, how, and what and when our children learn. So please, when you finish this session, take the time, visit turnthepageproject.com and you'll learn a whole lot more about it. So let's get on to our speakers. Throughout my 45 years of work, I've had the privilege to work with a lot of educators and two of the ones you'll hear from today have been longtime friends. First up is Tim Shriver. He's the chairman of the Special Olympics International and co-founder of Unite, which is a really exciting initiative to promote national unity and solidarity across our nation's differences. He also chairs the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, and he's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Fully Alive, Discovering What Matters Most. I'm really lucky to call Tim a friend. He's one of those people who's just the real deal, walks the walk, talks the talk, and does the work. After that, we'll hear from another longtime friend, Maria Hinojosa, the founder of Futuro Media Group, the anchor and executive producer of the Peabody award-winning show, Latino USA, and the co-host of the political podcast, In the Thick. Her new memoir, really great, if you haven't read it yet, Once I Was You, a memoir of love and hate in, in a torn America, is incredible and, and, and available everywhere books are sold. So, Tim? Let's get us started. Over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm Tim Shriver. I'm a T 
teacher by training. I've spent the early part of my career in the field of social and emotional learning and the second half of my career in the work of the Special Olympics movement on disability rights and building structures of communities that are supportive and welcoming of all kinds of human exceptionalities. And more recently, I have been involved in the work of a small not-for-profit startup called Unite, trying to look at the cultural and political challenges in our country from the point of view of the inner life and how we can each change. I'm grateful to be here to talk about the intersection of these worlds. What does this moment offer us? What are our schools and our children asking of us? And what can we hold in our hearts uh, as the central energy of equity, dignity, and possibility for all as we face this turning point. I'll, I'll make my points briefly. First, I think we are at the moment of maximum potential for change, certainly in my lifetime. Most of us in education spent most of our time, if we were interested in changing systems, trying to convince people that change was necessary. Today, we don't have to convince anyone. We have seen the burdens, the, uh, the extraordinary injustice that exists in our culture, in our system, in our politics, in our economies, and people are more open to change than ever. It's an extraordinary moment of opportunity. Number one, that change must be driven by an emphasis on equity, on equality, on dignity. Use the language that works for you, but the language has to say all children, without exception, deserve an equal chance. Secondly, I think the moment invites us to recognize that the digital revolution will present an entirely new landscape for us. We've seen this a little bit during COVID, the explosion of Zoom and digital and remote instruction. It hasn't always gone well, but it has opened us to the idea that the personalization of education could someday mean that the extraordinary capacity of digital execution, digital transmission could be matched with human connection to create a new universe where every child gets what they individually need and where all groups of children get collectively what they need at the same time. It's a faint dream right now, but I think it's possible. I think the third big issue, and maybe for me in some ways the most important, is that we have seen that our kids are living in a crisis of the inner life. Maybe our entire culture is. Some people refer to this as a mental health crisis, the toll that this crisis has taken on the mental health of our children. But before the crisis took place, we knew uh, 20, 30, 40% of our children were either dropping out or disengaged by the time they reached their teen years. We know that almost half of Americans uh, feel at least moderate to sometimes severe loneliness. We know the extraordinary rates of addiction, depression, suicide. We know we're living in a time when we are not capable of communicating to our kids where they fit in a larger story that matters. That to me presents a central challenge to us as educators, to us as a culture, for our children. If for no other reason, we have to address the social and emotional development of our children because they are telling us they are in pain. And unless they see their own story as something that matters, their own desires that matter, unless they see a world in which they belong, where they can trust their peers, where they can trust adults, unless they see a larger story of purpose into which they fit and where their roles and meaning making can find a larger context, unless they see those things, they are not going to flourish. We can beat our heads against the wall over test scores. We should demand excellence from everyone, no question about it. We can beat our heads against the wall over the way in which we compare to other countries. We should be competitive, no question about it. But if we do not address the social, the emotional, the hunger for empathy, for trust, for self-awareness, for value, for dignity, for purpose, for uh, the sense of service to a larger uh, whole. Unless we teach those explicitly, deliberately, and unless we equip our children with the strengths necessary to find meaning in their lives, we will continue to see carnage, endless, meaningless, preventable suffering, and all suffering 
that is endless and preventable is outrageous. We come back as we face the future to an awakening to the need for equity. We come back as we face the future to the new tools of the digital revolution. But more than anything, we come back to a country, to a culture, I dare say to a world, struggling to make sense, not just of the past, but of the present, and not just of the present, but of the future. We are lucky that we have generations of educators who have shown us we can teach the heart. If we fail now to incorporate those lessons into our schools, we will fail the test of our moment. Thanks for including me. And now I'll kick it back to you, Carol. Hi, everybody. I'm Maria Hinojosa. You may know my voice from a lot of time on the radio and in podcasts, Latino USA in the thick. I'm the founder of Futuro Media, and I'm also the author of my new memoir. It's called Once I Was You, a memoir of love and hate in a torn America. It's really great to be with you today. A lot of you know me as a journalist or as a writer or as a public thinker and commentator, but you may not know me as a professor, as a teacher. And so this notion of what to do with this moment and how we use this moment to transform how we think about education is something I've been thinking about for over a year. Because in the middle of teaching, at Barnard College, my alma mater, suddenly not only did I get sick with COVID a year ago in March of 2020, but I had to somehow adjust to teaching my students in a computer, off of a computer, when everything about my teaching style is about creating a safe space in the classroom. It's about a shared kind of vulnerability in a safe space. And I think this is a difficult thing to achieve in the United States of America right now when there is so much division and frankly so much division fomented on racial hate. It is not easy. Because one of the things this country has yet to do in its teaching beginning in primary school is to acknowledge this country's complicated history. I'm, you know, a bit older, so I had the pretty incredible experience of being in grammar school when the television series Roots dropped and the entire country was being educated about a part of American history that we had never been taught about in depth, which was slavery, the human cost of slavery, the importance of black lives. But, you know, that is not what we are known for doing in our educational system. So how do we take a moment that is traumatic and learn how to teach from this moment, in this moment, and, and because of this moment? One of the things that I said with, to my students was that there is nothing that I could teach them in a classroom that would teach them what they are learning in life's experiences because of what we were living through and are still living through. That there's nothing that I could say in the classroom that would give them that life experience, that life challenge of surviving something that if you would have said to us, oh, guess what? You're going to be on lockdown essentially for a year. We would have said, ha, 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 ha. And we did it. So for me, it's very important that we acknowledge in the classroom what we have been through. It's very important that we, in my view, create a space to talk about that. How teachers do this with, within a K through 12 setting, I think that's why you have teachers who study and are professionals you cannot apply the same way of thinking to a six-year-old to a 16-year-old. But both of them have experienced a certain level of trauma, separation, fear, hunger, as a result of this pandemic. 
total destabilization. I had students in an Ivy League setting whose families were hungry. They were hungry. These are first gen Mexican, Latino, undocumented or children of undocumented food workers from the Bronx and Queens who lost their jobs and suddenly there was no food in the home. So even in the demands that it places on us as teachers and as professionals and as professors, it's not the same. I think the conversation has to be how we talk about this and use this as the learning experience. Not teach around it, but rather go right into the center of it. I wrote down in my notes, show, not tell. What do I mean? And this is where I get, it gets difficult because how do we create, and that's why you have these great teachers who can do this, who can in fact create a safe space in the classroom. Because in order to understand the inequities that we have just lived through, we can talk about it in our classrooms. I mean, that's the beauty of public schools, frankly. That's why I love the fact that I went to public schools up until eighth grade, because you would see how the children of doctors next to the children of the person who worked at the grocery store. What are the other core issues that we as teachers, as professionals, as uh, people who have lived through not just this pandemic, but what has happened as a result of the years leading up to the pandemic, I'm talking about the politics of the Trump administration and the massive amount of disinformation, lies, untruths that we now have to deal with. This is a particular challenge. I know it's kind of like, oh my God, the elephant in the room, but we have to figure out a way to talk about this. You know, there are many in our communities who will not take the vaccine or or who may attempt not to, and how do we address that in a classroom? It's very delicate. Um, there's a saying that I love to teach and that I love to refer to. It's from Benito Juarez, the first indigenous president of Mexico, elected in 1865, the year that slavery ended in the United States of America. It was illegal in Mexico at the time already. Uh, Benito Juarez says, El respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz. Respect for other people's rights is peace. And so how do we understand what has happened post-pandemic where there are going to be some people who say, you can't infringe on my rights and force me to take a vaccine? How do we talk about this? It is the elephant in the room. I'm not saying I have the solution. Although, as somebody who survived COVID, I'm, I talk a lot about this publicly because I believe in the talking about it, in the expressing it, in giving it language and vocabulary, it is part of the healing. And so I also talk about my vaccine fear. I was very public. I was very lucky. I could call Dr. Anthony Fauci and just have an interview with him and say, talk me down from my fear. And one of the most important things to do is to acknowledge our fear. How do we teach teachers, professors, to be able to acknowledge their own fear and a student's fear without fear? Saying, it's okay, I recognize your anxiety. You know, I covered the blackout in New York City, I think it was 2003, after 9-11. You know, the first blackout in New York in 1977 was horrible. It was mayhem. In 2003, the blackout after 9-11, it was, you know, everybody was loving each other. We were not having a terrorist attack. We, we were survived. We knew that we'd have light and electricity eventually. And I interviewed a little girl uh, the day after, the morning after, and she said, the electricity was back on. And she said, oh my God, I wish that there was a blackout all the time because I went to the porch and I spent time with my parents and we told stories. Can there be another blackout soon? We learned things from this pandemic again that we could not be taught. The power of staying, the power of not moving, the power of connecting to nature, the power of family. 
the power of survival, of finding a way to make our way through this. That's what we need to think about teaching and talk about at all times in our classrooms. They're looking to us and we need to show them that we're survivors and we're vulnerable too and that it's okay to talk about it. We can do this together. The more we talk about it, the more we work on it. And I'm so thankful to Aspen for helping us create a dialogue. And now back to Carol. Thanks, Maria. Thank you, Tim. You know, I think, Tim, you said all children without exception. And Maria, you, you talked about the need for us to be emotionally present. I think both you and I early on in the pandemic talked about, you know, socially distant, emotionally present, and that continues today. The emotional impact of the past year is one that's gonna carry for, for decades, years and decades. We need to support our children. We need to support them academically and emotionally. And that should be our greatest priority, 100% of our future, our children. Our next speaker is probably the gold standard in this work. You know, I had the privilege to work with both Tim and with Maria on social justice issues, on learning the value of each unique child. And I've learned so much from both of them. But I think with my own kids, I didn't get any real street cred until this next guest came into my life as part of an anti-bias curriculum so many years ago, and that's Elmo. Elmo supports millions of kids on a daily basis, and we are all stronger, we are all smarter, we are all better because of it. Let's hear from our friend Elmo. on video, but Elmo really, really can't wait to see them at school again. Yeah, Elmo misses them so much. But, you know, Elmo feels a little nervous to go back because some things are going to be different. Oh, oh, but it's okay. Yeah, because Elmo's teachers will help Elmo and his friends learn and play together again. Yeah, we'll make art and build with blocks. Oh, and we'll have story time together. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. Elmo loves you. And we love you, Elmo. Let me tell you. So if I had mom cred when I got to meet Elmo, our next guest brought me mom cred this past week. Um, you know, I can just tell you that when we go from one superstar to the next. You know, last week I had the incredible privilege to sit down and speak with Academy Award winning artist, actor, author, Common. And so much of Common's philanthropy has been work dedicated to supporting students, to supporting young people, helping them to achieve their full potential. And through his amazing school in Chicago, you have to take some time and take a look at the school. It's called Art in Motion. The incredible programming that runs through the whole Common Ground Foundation, Common's work reaches thousands of people across the country every single year. The past year really put so much into question, including how to best help our students, how to help them adapt to what we're calling the new normal. And Common offered some thoughts and some helpful perspective in our conversation, and I'm going to share that with you right now. Hey, Common, thanks so much for being with us today. Really, it's great to have you here. You know, this is like a really critical issue, and I'm really interested in finding out for you, like, why education? Well, Carol, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm very grateful to be here um, and just share ideas and, and also absorb, too, um, and learn. Um, learning has been one of the, the most significant things in my life. Um, education on a holistic level and education began with me with my mother being yeah. a teacher being an educator herself she was very adamant about academic um excellence and and it spilled over to many other areas in my life and i've realized that education is an ongoing um process and it's active and it's present and it's forever evolving and, and i think you know education has for me has been so empowering me, empowering and it's giving me 
so much value to myself. Uh, it's given me so much value um, to, to myself and to the way I feel about who I am. So um, that's why I'm like so part of my education. Well, you know, and I know that you don't just talk the talk. You actually founded a school. You know, why don't you tell us a little bit about Arts in Motion? Yeah, our school, Art in Motion, Arts in Motion is um, based in Chicago, um, less than two miles from where I grew up, which I'm very, very proud of. It's, it's a school that's, of course, academics, but it's based in the arts also. Um, our kids range from, from seventh grade. We will build up going to high school because the school just started two years ago. We started with seventh grade. Now we, you know, we have seventh through ninth. Um, our kids, they they experience everything from from learning about nutrition. Um, I look at it as a holistic education because they learn about meditation. We actually have a meditation room. Our mm. kids, you know, on the walls are painted these different artists that they can aspire to be, whether it's Billie Holiday or, or John Coltrane or Whitney Houston or, or Gangstar, you know, like just the range. And, you know, it's, it's really a, a, it's a mentoring leadership type of school where I also wanted it to be something that, to create access for, for children who don't have access, but I mean it, access to things that I see and have experienced. Meaning, Carol, like, I want them to know, like, oh, it's on a, on a film set, it's a director of photography. It's a costume designer. It's a, it's a sound engineer. Um, I want them to be educated on those things so they can, like, gravitate to something that they may be passionate about. But if they exactly. haven't been introduced to it, they don't know. So Art and Motion exactly. embodies all of that. Um, and we are very, very inspired, and we have a charge for it, and it's a beautiful school. Oh, it sounds great. I, I want to go now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm coming. I'm, sign me up. Yeah. So this year, you know, it's been a challenge for kids across the country. You know, the murder of George Floyd, COVID-19, the racial awakening, you know, everything that's gone on, that the world just changed so much, you know. How do you think the schools need to adapt you know, to, to really help our kids cope with what's going on around them? Well, I definitely believe that mental health support for our kids is essential. Um, I believe like also being active in, in, I believe listening to, to our kids is very important. Meaning like actually taking in what, what they've experienced and, and making decisions from there. Like when I said education is active, um, I mean, it's, it's being present and being able to take in where we are with hearing from the kids. I believe Carol, any type of change for any communities, whether it's in education, whether it's, you know, going to specific communities and saying, hey, we want to improve this community. It takes the community to be involved too. So I think we have to involve our kids in at least expressing the things that they have experienced and, and the way they've received it and the way they enjoy and, and things that challenge them. So I think those, those type of conversations are important. And then um, just continuing to be, like think about education on a level of of like the, the human being as a whole, the, the youth as, as a whole saying, okay, we want our kids to not only be like great for, you know, in academics, but they also have to be emotionally healthy. They have to, I, I believe spirituality is, it would be beautiful to introduce children to different forms of spirituality and let them, you know, you know, along with whatever they foundation they have in their home, let them, be introduced to it and be aware of it. It, it may help them in, in, in them like being able to cope with certain things. So I just, I, I'm a really progressive <laughs> thinker when it comes to, to education. And, and, and I, cause I know what has helped me. And of course, obviously the arts is something that I feel like we have to have. That's why I aim has it's been important to me because if it wasn't for art, I don't think I would know who I am as much. I wouldn't feel as, the value I talked about that I have for myself, I wouldn't be able to be living in my purpose, to be honest. You know, it's it's interesting because I, I got my bachelor's degree in painting and ah. I always say it gave me the greatest, you know, it, it wasn't any skill set for what I do right now. It was a way to think. 
and but, that but, would think I got a question for you. Made my life. You I know, got a question for you. Being a being a painter, do you feel that that has enhanced what you do now? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it just makes me see things different. It makes me feel different and appreciate things different. Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. Yes. So, so, and, and I appreciate what you said about the psychosocial because I think that, you know, it's a learning day. It's not a school day. It doesn't end at three. That child is learning all day long. And so we've got to think about the totality of that child. So in that spirit, I think my last question for you is, as you think about the future, what gives you hope? What's Common's hope? My hope, I have, I'm very hopeful because kids that, I'm, that I've been able to be around and kids in my school to kids that like my friends, kids, I feel like this is a, a breed of children that are very brilliant and have a lot to say. You know, I, one of my good friends who's a musician Robert Glasper, his son reached out to us and, and started talking to me about politics and said, Common, are you, you know, well, he calls me Rashid. He's, you know, he said, are you okay? Because, you know, some people are saying politically that, that we, we need Joe Biden and, and, and Kamala Harris to be more active in this things and you supported them. And he really had a, a real conversation with me about it. And this young man is 12 years old. And I was like, wow. I don't even know if I even, I, I mean, I knew politics, but I didn't know like to the level that he was speaking. And then this young man could go create, he creates music at a, at a high level. My point is I've come across young people who, who have that capacity, who have that um, ability. Um, and I think with us thinking the way we, we the way we are thinking and, and really focused on what what does the future look like for our for our children and thinking outside of the box? We're going to actually feed and water those seeds and harvest and, and allow those young people to really have the best opportunities to be the best people they can be, human beings they can be, and I and that gives me a lot of hope. Um, and, and 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 you know programs like what we are part of now and, and those conversations turning into action. That's why I have hope. Well, thank you. Thank you for your hope. Thank you for what you're doing for the world's children. Really, really thank great. You. Thank you so much. God bless you. Love. It was so much fun to talk to Common, and, and he's just an incredible, incredible person, educator, thinker, really excited by what he's doing. And, and thank you, Common, for sharing your perspectives with all of us. So, our last guest today is really special. I actually said to her earlier today, you you know, all of us will be speakers today, but you'll be the person that an entire classroom will remember. 25 years from now, they'll still be talking about you. And that's, her name is Rosemary Collins. She's a third grade literacy teacher working at Lockwood Elementary School in Mississippi. She's one of those teachers that you know you're really lucky when you land in her classroom. Rosemary, thank you so much for being here today. We've heard some pretty unique perspectives from our partners. And I want to hear from you what, what you think, how we can rise to meet the new normal. So we're grateful to the, for the opportunity to learn from you, teach us today. Tell us what you learned over the past year. Thank you so much, Carol, for having me. Um, I'm Rosemary Collins. I'm a third grade interventionist in Mississippi, and I'm also a Teach Plus Educational Policy Fellow. And I'm so thrilled to be here today. Um, Something that I've learned over this past year is that we have really redefined what authenticity is uh, for teachers, for administrators, um, for communities and families. We have all had to show up differently in this past year. Um, and personally, um, I have just really learn to listen, listen to my community, listen to my family, um, and especially listen to my students. Um, so this past year, 
um, I have one student that really sticks out to me. Um, her name is Malaysia. And at the beginning of our sessions, she was very reserved, um, very timid. So to the point where most of our communication was through her mom and text messages. So um, after building community with her and just letting her know that this was a safe space, um, she began to blossom. Um, I also think she was really reserved as well because she was reading at a kindergarten level when we first met. So going into that relationship, um, I think after learning who I was, she really began to blossom and she especially liked our um, weekly visits. <laughs> It was socially distanced, of course. Um, so um, I can I will never forget this one time where I was delivering packets and I was a little later than usual. And I pulled up to her house and her grandfather meets me and he says, Malaysia said that you were coming. And I said, yes, I am. And he said that she said to him, Grandpa, um, if someone comes, it's for me, okay? <laughs> and I thought that was the cutest thing. It really made my heart smile. Um, and that also let me know that she knew that I was invested in her academically. I was invested in her personally. Um, and I was also engaging with not just her, but her entire family that lived in a home with her. Um, so through that relationship, I think it really gave her the motivation to progress in her reading and simply to show up every day in our sessions and try her best. Great. That's great. So when you like with everything you've learned, when you think about going back to school in the fall, how is school going to look different for your students when they come back? Mm -hmm. um, this next year um, is going to look different for all districts and all communities. Um, this past year, we've all implemented instruction in a different way. Some went hybrid, some were virtual. Um, my district was one of the ones who was majority virtual. So um, going into this next year, we're really going to have to be mindful of the well-being of teachers and of students. Um, also, we need to make sure that we're looking at the whole community and the whole class. Um, one thing that I think we kind of get away from in education as children matriculate up in grades is play. And I think playing in this next year is going to be so important because that is going to help students address those emotional pieces and those um, social pieces that they may have missed um, due to being isolated during COVID from their peers. Um, and play also will help us address those academic goals, like get them to the academic goals once they're expressing themselves. Um, in my classroom, we always play. <laughs> it is something that I think builds community. Um, it gets students to own the classroom. Um, and it just really gets them involved in the learning space. Um, one game that we play every morning <laughs> is the good morning game. And all it is is the student, a student will say, good morning, my name is, and everybody in the class will say, good morning, and name that person. And I think that just builds community in the classroom. It shows a longingness, and it really just makes every student feel like this is their class. <clears throat> so, and plus, like, who doesn't like to be greeted by name, good morning. right? Exactly. <laughs> so good morning, Carol. Good morning, Ms. Collins. <laughs> Last question for you, and that was a perfect lead into it. You know, we talked a lot about the students and what they can expect in the classroom. What do you want the audience to know about what it means to be a teacher right now? Um, all right, right now, teachers, we just need support. Um, 
just know that we are part of communities, we are part of classrooms, we are part of schools, and we need your support um, in that way. Um, something that I think the audience can do <laughs> to help teachers as well um, is just invest in public schools. Um, make sure that you are investing in your local public schools. Um, invest your time, invest your ideas, your energy, um, invest your attention into public schools. And, um, and that means you may or may not have a student or a child at those schools, but still visit, go there, bring your talents, bring your knowledge into the classroom. Um, many students may have barriers that hinder them from going out into community. So we want to bring the community in to the schools. Um, I always say, meet them where they are, teach them where they are. And where are students? Where are children? at schools. And so as um, we go into this next year and we think about how we want to build an equitable educational system, we want everyone to be involved and all hands on for the better. Um, and plus, um, we need you. We need everyone involved in educating our children. So, you know, there's been, first of all, thank you to everybody who's been putting stuff, questions in because boy, we've been flooded with conversation. I'm enjoying it. So, you know, Rosemary, you spoke about the power of play. Audience wants to know, how can we be sure that teachers of older children, even teens, incorporate this concept? Okay. Um, kids are gamers. <laughs> like even teenagers, they're gamers now. They um, understand what it means to be on team. So for lower grades, it's really more hands-on and uh, play as in active play. Um, but as they matriculate up into teen age, make sure you build community with putting them on teams, um, strategizing, um, understanding how to um, develop solutions to real life problems. Uh, it doesn't always have to be textbook. It can be something in real life to where they have to figure out and work together as a community to solve an issue. And what about, you know, the in a remote learning environment? You know, how do we assure this whole support that we've been talking about for the past, you know, hour? Um, how do we assure that for to a child, to the vulnerable child who may not be back in the classroom? Um, with my students, majority of them were um, virtual. So, and, and we only saw each other once a week in person. And I just went by and um, saw them at that once, one time a week. And that just really showed tremendous interest in our relationship. Um, you, If you can't get to your students' home, just make sure to have one-off conversations with them. Invite them in um, into private chat class rooms. Um, having conversations with students is so important. Um, be authentic with them because they've gone this past year, they've gone through this um, pandemic and we've gone through the pandemic. So just being able to show that you are also um, going through this. You have also gone through this as well. Um, something that I've talked about with some colleagues this year and just a realization is that this is the first time that teachers and students have gone through something traumatic together. You know, usually when students come in our classroom, we have the tools, the information, the knowledge on how to address student trauma or trauma period, but now we are actually going through it as well. So putting that out there, being authentic, having those real conversations um, and letting students know, hey, I'm here with you. I can help you through this. Let's talk about it. That is how we can really get through to our students this year. So I know the one last point I'll make because a couple of you have asked about the stimulus bills in the chat. You know. 
it's really important that we all get involved, that we let the community leaders know that our schools are hurting, they need these dollars, that we find creative uses and you use your voice to make that happen. I really wanna encourage everyone. And to think in terms of, as we said earlier, the learning day, not just the school day, those after school programs, psychosocial support of the kids. You know, all three of our speakers talked about being emotionally present, how important it is to young people right now. And, I, you know, to quote Tim, you know, doesn't matter what language we use, all children without exception, you know, every single child deserves to learn, deserves the opportunity to learn in his or her own way. And we need to make sure we're providing the support to make all that happen. Thank you, Rosemary, for joining us today. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Common. Thank you, Elmo. Thank you all for being here. We look forward to more sessions and more learning together. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.